Um, okay, so what I'd like to do now for today is, um, last class we were talking about this idea of ranking functions. And uh, we went through, uh, I'd like to finish my lecture on ranking functions and then start to talk about projects in here. So uh, in semester, you know, the, this is going to be the last of the, homework three is the last of the homeworks that we're going to be worrying about. So hopefully you'll have some proficiency in doing some of these kind of things. Then we're going to go to the grad projects. And I want to go through, talk about the grad projects in detail today. Um, but I'd like to start, first start by finishing the lecture we were talking about with ranking functions. Any questions at this point? So last class, what we were talking about ranking functions, what were ranking functions? They were ways you know, that we would like to be able to um, take data uh, that we have about entities and come up with some kind of a measure of merit where there's something that we are concerned with and try to come up with a way of scoring um, these things on a basis of merit. If it's restaurants, you'd like to know which is the best restaurant and which is the worst restaurant. So we're interested in basically the general problem, given data that you have about, um, about entities, how can we come up with a ranking of these things? Okay, and we talked about a couple of different ways we could do it. We talked about simple linear combinations of scores like I typically use to give grades. We talked about the ELO rankings. We talked about some other things. Any questions about what ranking functions are or why we would care about them? Or anything left over from last time about ELO or anything like that? Okay, I'd like to go through a couple of other approaches to generating rankings that are kind of interesting. And um, the first one has to do to think about rankings as voting. Again, we are in the election year this year in the United States. And, uh, you know, you can imagine a world where, you know, you would like to determine who is the best person to become president, okay? Or what is the relative order of candidates to become president? Um, you know, the way we do this in the United States in principle is with votes, okay? You could imagine a world where there's a set of possible items and every voter comes along and comes up with a ranking of who they like most, who they like second most, who they like third most. And that the, the ranking function, the problem comes up, given a large number of people's choices, how do we go and figure out who's first, who's second, who's third? Okay? So there's kind of a ranking, an aggregation problem that is analogous to ranking, uh, aggregating votes. Any questions? In, in any, did anybody come from a country where they use multi-party votes where you rank who you think is first, second, and third, or just sort of you vote for your favorite? Okay, where we come from most, in general you vote, vote for your favorite. In Australia, you actually do have to rank, all, you get the opportunity to rank all the candidates from best to worst, and there's a more, you know, there's a different procedure for aggregating the votes. Okay, so, how would we, the question now is how can we come up with a rank ordering on things where you had lots of people vote, voting on things? Does anybody know of any situation where you do have different, let's say, permutations given by voters and have to aggregate them? There's one, at least one famous example of this if you're an American college football fan, okay? You know, that in the United States, they, 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 they're top 20 football teams. What? The picks? Not the draft picks, but when it comes time to rank the top football teams in the country, they go to every football coach and they say, you tell me what are your, who do you think, what is your ordering of the top 20 teams? And these are somehow magically combined to yield the, the final ordering. So how can we go about doing that? Okay, any questions? So the standard way, or a, a, a good way to do this, is a method called Borda's method, where what they will do is, um, if you have, here's a world where we've got five items, okay, take it back, um, we've got five items, A through E, okay, and each one of four voters ranks the items from best to worst. So voter one said it was A, C, B, D, E, Voter four said it was A, B, D, C, E. The problem of finding a consensus ranking is given all of these things, okay, given the collection of votes, how would we find a final order 
in terms of what's best. Any ideas how you would do it? Okay, let's just, before we just to keep people warm here. If I give you a bunch of votes, a, bu a bunch of these ordered rankings, how might you combine them to a uh, thing, yeah? So you are proposing what is basically Borda's method. You, you, you assign for e being in each position, you get a certain number of points. Does everybody see that? So you get one point in this case for being first, two points for being second, three points for being fourth. For any particular element, A, we total up the point total for its, all of its ranks and all of its permutations. And then you sort the items on the basis of where they, uh, their final scores. Okay? This seems like a perfectly reasonable way to um, come up with a, a consensus ordering. Any questions? Okay, this is actually probably how the football people do it, okay? Except for one issue. Is there any issue remaining with this method? Yeah? So what you're saying is if there is no consensus on the part of the voters, the consensus ranking is going to be, you know, not as trustworthy as if there was consensus. So we agree. In an ideal world, there would be consensus among the voters, and then we would be, if all the voters agreed, every one of them, on the, the order, then there's no question what the final order is. What should be clear is that if you, that where you get into trouble is when there is a, you know, divergence of opinions, okay? But it's not clear that this does a terrible job even then. I mean, th th there may be no good job to be done, yeah. okay? That's right, yeah. So, okay, so there is a question that actually gets back to it, which is, I think a little bit is, what are the ranks? How many points do you give for each position? This is kind of where I'd like to say that there is a, a, a question. Why did, in this case, we give the numbers 1 through 5, okay, as the weights, okay? Maybe we want to give more weight to being in the top half than being in the bottom half, right? You could imagine a world where you gave weights 1, 1.001, 1.002, and at the half point, everything becomes 2, you know, makes a big difference. There's no law that says that you have to weight these things this way. And is there any sensible way that we might be able to give weights? Okay? So let's think about this a little bit. This idea of doing, uh, as we did before, where we give basically linear position weights, I will claim that that makes a lot of sense if you have equal confidence in your ability to make distinctions all the way through the rankings, okay? So if we take a look at this, if I'm ranking all the students in this class, okay, am I as confident in my decision, distinction between the first and the second person as I am between the 25th and 26th person in this class, okay? Borda's thing would say in both cases the rankings differ by one. You're going to give them the same one point difference, right? But does everybody see, do, do we think in general we have that level of confidence, okay? What would you say if you had to think about, let's say if you have your, your feelings about these are the best and these are the worst, okay? Where would you, let's say, be, if you had to think about your confidence in the distinctions between them, generally speaking, where are you most confident? The best and the worst. Okay, so certainly you should be able to tell the difference between this guy and this guy. You pretty trust that. But that's not really the question at hand. The real question is, if I look at neighboring guys in your rankings, how confident are you with the distinctions between these? Okay, yeah? So you're saying that you're more confident in the difference here than the difference between these two. 
Okay. What about between the last, the worst, and the next to worst? Are you? You think that's a that that's one that you're not very confident on? To my mind, I would say that 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 there are you know this person is a complete disaster, and this person is a disaster. Okay, I know. I think there's actually if if we were thinking about things as being normally distributed, okay, or something like this, okay. I claim that there is going to be a bigger spread between things on either end than there would be in the center. Okay, let's think, let's think this through and decide whether we believe this or not. Okay, what does a normal distribution mean? It means that there is a lot more, the x-axis was the actual score difference, right? The y, the actual score, the y-axis was the um, frequency of this, OK? So suppose I have um, elements, let's say 100 elements, sampled uniformly among the, the, the normal distribution. Then the area in each one of these slabs, OK, should be equal probability. Does that kind of make sense? If I pick 100, these items at, at equal probability, because the, 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 where the distribution is taller, if it's got the same area as one where the distribution is shorter, then it's got to be wider boxes. Does everybody see that? And so you would kind of think that if you were sampling things uniformly, you would expect that there would be bigger gaps between the, the very best and, and the second best than there would be between the n over second and the n over second plus one. Does that kind of make sense? OK. So if this is so, then probably what you would like to do is to give higher weights, OK? Have the difference between the weights for being in positions from here to here should be small relative to the distinctions that you're giving between here and here. Does that kind of make sense? So you should probably give your weights basically according to a normal distribution. Yeah? The reason I thought that the top would be the thing that would be greater, I mean, oh, sorry. Yeah, the greater side would be because I was thinking of knowledge. So like it's, it's one thing to say, okay, so the candidates themselves went are distributed this way. But right. It's another thing to say, like, your knowledge is distributed about those candidates. That's another way to think about it that I think is an appropriate thing. If you think about it, if I think about what do I know about the football teams in the United States, OK? The, the top football teams in the United States, if I'm a football coach, I know about them. What do you know about Stony Brook's football team? You didn't see them on television. You didn't, you know, you wouldn't uh, know very much, right? And that's an argument that, um, that you're, you're, you probably place greater faith in your decisions at the, uh, at, at, at the, 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 the top rather than the end. And likewise, again, in general, th does that hold on the other side? There's always an article written about the worst football team in the country, OK? So I would imagine, generally, there is probably some symmetry of information at the other end, although that's debatable, OK? Any, any questions about that, OK? So this is an argument that may be using some form of normally distributed weights or perhaps half normally distributed weights. Notice that if the phenomena that we cared about was the one you said, which is we know the most about the best ones and the least about the worst ones, OK? Then we, if we drew the weights from here to here, that would then be capturing what you're doing, OK? But in either case, linear position weights only make sense if we have equal confidence. Any questions about that? OK, and that gives you a way of making these rankings. Another, let me give you another way of uh, interpreting perhaps votes as uh, if we have votes of things. We might be able to interpret this as a graph ordering problem in the following way. It's another way of thinking about these kind of ways of coming up with rankings. 
Suppose when we, we, we had data that are basically binary comparisons, that A is better than B, okay? That's what happened for, you could argue, what happened in the ELO example. Remember the chess rankings? We knew that I was better than you because I beat you at chess, right? So suppose we have a bunch of pairs where every time there is a direct comparison between pairs of elements, we make a directed edge that I dominate you, okay? You could now imagine, or if I give you, what, you know, a permutation, let's say, you could interpret every pair where if I view myself as, if, if you view x is better than y, add an edge from x to y. It should be clear that we can now interpret either pairs, matches, or maybe even longer chains of matches as these uh, directed edges in a network, okay? And what we would like to do is to find a way to order the vertices, okay, such that they respect the order and direction of these edges. Does that, that kind of make sense? Now, what problem from your graph theory days, okay, or your algorithm days, has to do with taking a directed graph and constructing an order on the vertices? Okay, you've seen that in your graph algorithms class. What was that called? Topological sorting. Does everyone remember topological sorting? Topological sorting said if you were given a graph where there were no cycles in it, a directed acyclic graph, okay, then topological sorting was the problem of ordering the vertices so that there is that, that all the edges go from left to right. That if I am better than you, that basically if, if these edges reflect I being better than you, then the was an ordering so that none of those relations are violated. Does everybody see that? So what's good about topological sorting? If I give you this, is it fast to compute a topological sort? It's linear time, right? It's easy to do, it's easy to interpret. What's bad about using a topological sort in this context? Okay. Space, not the space. Okay. Well, when can't we do a topological sort? Whenever there is a any first of all, there, if they're in the disjoint components, you know, if we have you know like you know the, the tournament only among men and a tournament among women, we have no way of interleaving them. That's certainly true, but that's the nature of the data. The bigger problem has to do with what if there are inconsistencies. Okay. Does everybody see that topological sort is only defined if there are no cycles in the graph? There is a little problem that if you don't give me enough edges, there can be multiple topological orderings. But the big problem we have to worry about is that in ranking, generally there's going to be inconsistencies. You cannot expect, the problem is too easy if everybody agrees on everything consistently. So there's a class of algorithms for doing rankings that would reduce to the following kinds of problems. Given a directed graph that is, you know, a general directed graph, find a way to, to delete the smallest number of edges such that you have a DAG. Okay? If we think about it in the right ordering, what would we like to have happening? If somebody, if there's preference functions and we come up with an ordering, most of the time it's going to respect our preference functions, but occasionally, there's going to be somebody who disagreed with us, right? And somebody who disagreed with us would be an edge going the wrong way. Does everybody see that? So I would claim that the way that you would really want to think about this is, given a directed graph of these votes, what is the, find me an order that will minimize the smallest number of wrong way edges. Okay, or equivalently, find the smallest number of edges to delete from my da graph to create a DAG. Okay, and it, see that it seemed like a reasonable formulation. The good news is it's reasonable. The bad news that gets us into an NP-complete problem. Okay, so that that finding what the smallest number of edges to delete is a you know becomes hard. But they're not 
natural ways to think about now starting to come up with orders that will try to minimize the number of edges going both ways. How would you, given a graph dag like that, how might you come up with an order that sort of will respect it? I now give you a graph where there's edges going every which way. It's got cycles in it, yada, yada. What might be a reasonable order to start? OK. What? So you might want to say, you're saying maybe put first the one with the most outgoing edges. OK, and maybe that one's going to be first, right? OK, so that might be a different way. To, so, so one idea, well, I think that's a slightly better way. But let's just go through and work with this a little bit. Start with the one with the, with the most outgoing edges. Put that first. Delete these edges, and now ask yourself, which other edge then has the number of most outgoing edges? In fact, in that case, I guess they're really, uh, you know, um, you know, basically, they're, I guess in that case, you don't really need to deal with the deletions. Basically, you're saying sort them by the number of outgoing edges. That would be one way to do it. But if they play wildly different number of games, that's probably not the right thing. If there's a lot more votes about one than the other, you know, Donald Trump will have half the votes here. There's going to be a lot of edges for and against him, right? Another idea might be to take a look at for every vertex, what is the in degree and what is, how many edges are there going into it and how many edges are there going out of it. The node that should be first should have the most outgoing minus ingoing edges. Does that make sense? And so sorting them by the difference between out and ingoing edges seems like a reasonable thing, right? And you know, and there's lots of different variations of these kind of heuristics. But this now starts to give you an idea that there's a class of these kind of ways you can take these DAGs and produce them to orders that mean something. Any questions? OK, any questions about this class of uh, ranking schemes? Yeah. Yes. So in this particular example, you're saying you look at my example. Here's a picture of a directed a, cyclic, a directed graph where there's a cycle here, a cycle here, and these edges go from here to here, and there was a cycle there. I showed that if you deleted these three edges, what was left was a, a dag, right? What should go first now? If it is a dag then by definition, there is at least one topological order to it, right? If you run topological sorting on it, it will come up with an ordering. There might be many such orderings, OK? But at the very least, it is clear that if I delete it, enough edges to break it, and I have a topological sorting algorithm, I will get an ordering from it. Any questions about it? OK, any questions about this, this kind of ordering methods? Yeah. So you're telling me that you could delete a different set of edges. You're right that I could have deleted this one instead of this one. And you're right, that gives me a different uh, a DAG. Is one better than the other? I don't see any reason right now. OK? They probably might give me different topological orderings at the end. But the basic question of find me an ordering that minimizes the number of unhappy votes seems like a reasonable criteria. And you know this starts to get at that kind of a question. Any questions? OK, good. Now, what may come up that should be th you should start to think about a little bit is there's several different ways of doing rankings, OK, to come up with an ordering of these things. OK? Which is the best way to do it? We could have used ELO. We could have used one of these digraph methods. We could have done a lot of things, OK? The interesting thing is that there's a, a theoretical argument that there is no single best way to do rankings of things. Okay, and this is actually kind of an interesting point. There's a famous theorem in political science called Arrow's Impossibility Theorem, which says that it is impossible to design an election system with the possible property with the the um, 
with uh, the following kinds of natural properties that you would want an election system to have. So suppose you have a bunch of candidates like we have, and they all have a, pref a relative order, a preference among you know, all the candidates. You would like the system to kind of come up with answers with certain properties. Like you'd like it to be the case that if candidate A is preferred by the system to candidate B, and candidate B is preferred by the system to candidate C, then you'd like it to be the case that candidate A is preferred to candidate C. That seems like a natural thing to, to have in an election system. You would like to have an election system with the property that there's not a dictator. One way we could have an election system, like if we could have an election in this system in the class as to whether we would have a final exam, okay? I could let everybody vote, but if my vote count is the only one that counts, we have a dictator in here, right? And there's a lot of ways we can make that consistent, but let's say we don't want there to be a dictator, so that everybody's vote has to, in some sense, potentially count. Okay? And you also might want that if A is preferred by to B, shouldn't matter on other candidates. So if you bring in another, let's say you want to figure out if Trump is preferred to Hillary or Hillary preferred to Trump, adding other candidates to the mix shouldn't change the relative question of who prefers Hillary to, tr Clint, to, to Trump, okay? You'd kind of like there to be that, that, that the choices here would be independent. The interesting thing here is that there is no system that you can, no way you can kind of combine all these permutations, all these votes, in a way that satisfies all of these properties, okay? And that's an argument in some sense that there's not a best possible election system. Okay, as an example of why these kind of paradoxes come up, let's take a look at this situation. Here's a case where voter X likes red ahead of green ahead of blue. Voter Y likes uh, blue, red, green. Voter Z likes green, blue, red. Does everybody see that? Which is better? Who, do, if, if you had an election between blue and red, who would win in this case? So you see that there's three voters. They each give their orderings here. Is red preferred to blue? If we look at this, one voter likes red ahead of blue. This voter likes blue ahead of red. This one says that uh, blue wins. Wait. So, okay, so by this argument, did I get my labels wrong? By this argument, it looks like blue beats red. Does everybody see that? Which is the backwards of what I have here, okay? So let's, just, let's see if I try, I don't get into trouble. We say blue beats red. Does everybody agree? Now, what about comparing green and blue? Okay, it looks like green beat blue. Blue beat green, green should beat blue, right? Green beats blue, right? So therefore, since if we naturally assume this kind of thing, doesn't that mean that green beats red? And if we take a look at this thing, what do we know? Red beats green, red beats green. Does everybody see this? So. This is an example where, with these kind of voters, there's no way to make it th th this kind of thing transitive. Does everybody kind of see that? The truth is, in an election like this, all three of them are basically tied, is the natural way to interpret this kind of thing. But the punchline here is that there is no, you know, by Arrow's theorem in some sense, there is no voting system that is arguably better than any, any other one. Okay, or, or that is better, that, that, that satisfies all of these properties. Okay, and so that's an argument that says that there's many different ways we can combine things to come up and rank them. We shouldn't be convinced that we have the absolute best ranking system. Okay, but rather that there's a lot of different ways to, that are reasonable to try to order these things, and we should try to find something that, is, uh, that we're satisfied with. Any questions? Okay. Fair enough. 
Okay. To end this section, just uh, quickly, I want to just give you uh, one example of, a, let's say, in practice, something that a, a ranking system that we built, it's just as a, uh, you know. So I think ranking systems are good things. Okay. Now, real computer scientists will say machine learning is a great thing, and that you want to build a gold standard of. Uh, things, and that to do science, you want to try to regress to a gold standard. And I'm going to do that for most of the semester. But in a large number of cases, as I've said before, you have things that you would like to order to get some insight to them, that maybe there isn't a, a real gold standard. But I still claim that, that if you analyze a data set, you can learn interesting things by doing it. So we had a project where we were ranking historical figures based on their historical significance by trying to analyze Wikipedia data. So what did we do? We took a look at a bunch of different uh, factors that we could extract from Wikipedia that we thought were meaningful. Page rank is a good example. If you think of it, Wikipedia pages for people as being a, a network, if my article cites somebody else's article, that probably is a mean that I say this other guy is important, right? There's no question there's a lot more people who, whose links refer to George Washington's article than to Stephen Skeena's article, right? The length of a page, longer Wikipedia pages probably represent more important people. Pages that get read by more people are probably more important pages, okay? So we combined, we developed a, 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 a system that basically extracted these things. We normalized these value distributions, okay? Because we, again, we had this notion that, uh, as, as we've discussed in here, if you have um, bell-shaped distributions, linear combinations of them are natural things. If you have some distributions that are power law distributed, linear combinations don't work as well. So we found a way to normalize them. We used a linear combination of these factors as our score of significance. And we did something that's a little bit outside the context of what we did in here. But we corrected some of these factors to make it so that people older in history, OK, would get more points than people who are recent in history. Because you know, if you look at how many hits some, a, a singer is getting. A popular singer today is going to get a lot more hits today than a singer from 100 years ago. But if you wait 100 years from now, the current singer isn't going to be. So we corrected for time. <coughs> and when we did that, we were able to rank all the people in the English Wikipedia. There were over 800,000 of them. And these were the people who came up on top 20. I don't know if you can read them there, but they're people like Jesus, Napoleon, Shakespeare, Muhammad, uh, Abraham Lincoln, Washington, Hitler, Aristotle. The people who rose to the top by this measure are people who, if you have a modest knowledge of, of history in the English-speaking world, you would all think are very prominent people. Okay, And so that's a sign that this kind of scoring function did capture a lot of what we wanted it to capture. Yeah? How did you correct for time? How did we correct for time? To be precise, what we did was we looked at another data. We, we, OK, you had to have a model to sort of decay reputations as a function of time. OK, so you might say that, let's say, somebody's fame is going to be half as much 100 years from now than it is now. OK? or to calibrate how much fast fame, record, fame decayed, we looked at these Google Ngrams data. Remember these Google Ngrams data I told you, told you how much you're being talked about in books, right? If we take a look at a popular singer from 1920, and we look at how fast are they are being talked about decaying in books, you can see that there's a relatively steady rate of decay. And by looking at all the famous people, how fast did their no, references in books decay as a function of how long ago they lived, you can come up and plot such a decay function in a reasonable way. Is that convincing or clear enough? Yeah. Yeah. Well, okay, so 
what is clear is that, that Jesus has talked about a great deal today in books, right? That is a sign that Jesus is an important person. Shakespeare has talked a lot about books, okay? The fact that these people are both all very old and still talked about a lot is a sign that they are very important. It's possible Justin Bieber is talked about more than Jesus these days, okay? But if you look 2,000 years in the future, we have reason to believe that, you know, if, if Jesus has been decaying for 2,000 years, the fact that he's still so prominent is a vote that, that, that he's going to stay prominent. And by fitting it to the data that we had, we had what I think is a very reasonable decay model. The details we, we don't have to discuss. Any questions? Yeah. Is there a slight bias? There's a very strong bias. Okay, so if you want to say, you know, wait, we are, uh, you know, I read Bengali. Why isn't, uh, you know, I'm a, a Bengali speaker. Why isn't, you know, uh, Nehru higher here? Okay, and the reason is, of course, you're right. This is an English encyclopedia, so there is a bias because of that data. Okay, so in fact, you can do the exact same analysis in different encyclopedias, and you're right, in, you'll get different measures here. But I still say that there's a, so, so you're right that this is an English pr view of history, okay? And that, that I can't argue, let's say I can't argue with that. Except that I can, can say that, uh, you know, all the people, you know, that there's every prime minister of India and vice prime minister of India is in here. Also, the relative rankings of people from different cultures probably still has a lot of meaning, okay? To compare them to say, oh, say, oh, is George Washington really bigger than Nero? I'm not going to sit here and say yes. In an English-speaking world, I would say yes. Okay? But, you know, but I'm only making claims about the English encyclopedia. Any questions? Yeah. Right. So one possibility you could do that some other people have done is do things on all the different Wikipedias and try to merge them. But how do you merge them? How much does the Bengali Wikipedia count compared to the English Wikipedia? So, is it, can, it But how right? do you weight it? Okay, I mean, however you weight it, recognize that you're making some kind of an assumption or a statement, right? And so this is, I guess, getting back a little bit to the arrow kind of an idea, a little bit, that there's no best way to do these kind of it's not obvious to me how you come up with a ranking there that means what you want it to mean. Okay? So, I mean, in my mind, I, I will agree these are English-speaking things, and it would be dumb for me to say, hi, you know, America's a better country than India because you don't have, your leader isn't as high as uh, in the English Wikipedia. That would be a dumb thing to say, right? But from a point of view of, of looking at some of these figures and categorizing them, how they are, impacting the Anglo culture, this is not a terrible thing to do, okay? Any questions? Okay. And there's interesting things you can start to do, though, with rankings once you have quantified them. And this is kind of where I think the exercise starts to be more interesting than just my guy's better than your guy, okay? So one thing that you can look at here, this is a graph where we looked at over the function of time how what is the ranking score that we give scientists who won the Nobel Prize each year? Okay, so on the left side, we take a look at, uh, so let's take a look at ma no, pick physics. How, can somebody name me some Nobel Prize winning physicists? Feynman. Feynman, okay, name me some Nobel Prize winning physicists. Einstein, Einstein. name me some Nobel Prize winning physicists. Rutherford. What? Rutherford. Rutherford, okay, name me some Nobel Prize winning physicists. What? Uh, Marie Curie. Higgs, okay, maybe, okay, yeah. Marie Curie, okay. Marie Curie, okay, okay. I guess what I would say is, generally speaking, most of the names you gave me were old names, okay? How many people can you, Nobel Prize winners from the last 10 years or 20 years, can you name, okay? If you look at the significance of Nobel Prize winners as a function of time, you'll see that the oldest Nobel Prize winners, these are, these are, each line represents a different prize, the physics prize, the chemistry prize, or something like that. If you look at this, the, the oldest, the original prize winners were the most prominent ones. 
Why was that? If you had to take a think about it. Yeah? You say it's about an elite notion. I don't know if I'd buy that completely. I would say that there was a backlog that by definition you were giving it to the greatest living physicist at that time as opposed to the greatest living physicist who hasn't gotten a prize yet. Does everybody kind of believe that? So if you have to give the first winner of a prize, should be better than the second winner of a prize. Okay, because you could have given it to both of them at the time. But if you look at this thing, you'll see that the level in recent years of Nobel Prize winners has dropped considerably, okay, in all the sciences. And if you compare them to literature and Peace Prize winners, these guys have maintained their stature over the years. So this is capturing something that I think is a real phenomena, that for whatever reason, Nobel Prize winning scientists today are not figures of the same stature. Not necessarily they're not as smart. They're probably as smart or smarter. But somehow they are not becoming members of the popular culture the way that they did in the old days. Okay? And this to me is kind of interesting. You can quantify something like that. And I think that's a real phenomenon. Yeah. This is, this is our ranking. The measure here is a, basically our ranking score, our measure of significance by looking at their Wikipedia pages and stuff like that. Okay? So if you believe it captures it, this captures a phenomena that I think is an interesting phenomena. Any questions? Yeah. So you would expect it to go down, but there's a question of how far down does it go. That's probably the difference that I would kind of say. And one thing that is surprising to me, when you look at this thing, all the science winners these days are lower ranked figures than the people who win the Nobel Peace Prize or the Literature Prize. Okay, it is clear to me that there is some reason, and I think I know why, Nobel Prize scientists are less prominent figures than they used to be. Part of it is that science is a lot more specialized than it used to be, okay? Part of it is that, that, that it's, it's less clear, you know, the discoveries that get Nobel Prizes are less likely to hit the headlines than they were used to be. You mentioned Higgs. Higgs is a reasonably recent guy, but there's this big, dis, you know, there's relatively few of the prizes go to things that are that prominent, okay? And so I claim this is a phenomena that you can capture. There's other phenomena that you can start to look at here that become interesting. So for example, one thing we looked at was whether or not, what was the relative significance of the men and, and versus the women in Wikipedia? If Wikipedia, people were getting into Wikipedia equally for accomplishments, you wouldn't expect there to be much difference between the men and the women. Okay, but this is a graph where the x-axis is what year they were born, and the y-axis is a measure of how significant they are. And if you look at it, the women, which is the top line, are more substantially more significant in Wikipedia than the corresponding men. In other words, you had to have done more in some sense as a woman to get into Wikipedia than as a man, okay? and that you can now quantify this kind of a thing. And I think this is an interesting kind of an evidence that there are biases of stuff like that. So bottom line is that there are different things that, again, we, we, I have a book about this that I personally like because I wrote it, and I think it's interesting. But by looking at these kind of rankings, it's a way of quantifying things that are otherwise hard to talk about in a quantitative way. And I think you can make some, some bigger conclusions by doing that. And that's why I think rankings are a good thing. Any questions about rankings, historical, or anything else? Okay. Again, machine learning and all these other methods are good things too. We'll be talking about them um, in coming weeks. Any questions? Okay, good. What I wanted to now talk about, just to finish up the class, is I want to talk about the project, course projects. So let me pass out. Um, I prepared a course project. Uh, pass these out here. Okay, this on, keep these on this side of the table. You guys pass these, keep these on this side of the, the table. So I wanted to talk about um, what the course projects are in here to get people starting to think about it. Uh, 
your proposal, the way that we're going to do the course project is you, they're done in s small groups, okay, possibly groups of one, but typically groups of two, maybe three. Um, they are, you're going to need to submit a proposal in uh, um, a, a, about two weeks from now of what you're going to be doing. You're then going to have to submit a progress report about a month later, and then at the end of the semester, a final report. So I want to see you know, some evidence of these kinds of things. And um, what I want you to do is, um, so for picking a course project, I have a list which we're going to go through to some extent here of possible projects. But I'd like to start off by saying I am very, very happy if any group comes up with their own project topic. Okay? I have certain kinds of projects I like and certain pro projects I don't like. But I would be perfectly happy and maybe more happy if everybody came up with their own project topic within my scope of like or dislike. So what do I like? I like projects that where you say, oh, here's a cool thing. I can get a cool data set. I can do something that is exciting. Let me go ahead and do it. Okay? And if you find something that you can find a cool data set and you have an interesting question or model or project or ranking or analysis that you want to do on it, that I think is a great project. Okay? So if you come up with your own project, this is a win. Any questions? Now, what projects don't I like to see? I do not like to see somebody who takes a data set that someone may have posed as a challenge, saying, oh, build a model for this data set. And you build the 117th model, because there were already 116 models for it. Does everybody see that? So I don't want somebody to say, oh, I got this great data set from Kaggle, which is this thing for doing modeling challenges. That I'm going to say I'm probably, I'm not interested in that. Does that kind of make sense? I don't want people to do things that are basically something that they're doing from their thesis project or one of their other classes. Does this kind of make sense? So sometimes people say, oh, great, I'm doing a my thesis project, and I, I'm going to analyze some of that data and call it yours. That's not, that's not kosher, OK? Any questions about that? OK? And I don't like it when somebody takes another paper somebody wrote, you know, a research paper, and tries to reproduce the results, essentially. They read a paper. They take their data set. They fiddle with the parameters. They get it slightly, slightly, slightly higher scoring. And they think that's a good thing. All that you've done is show variance in the modeling parameters. Okay, That's something that doesn't interest me. Any questions? But saying, oh, yeah, I'd really like to build a model for doing this. And I think I can start from that data set is a wonderful thing. Any questions? And I'm happy to talk with people about projects. OK. I list a couple of projects here, uh, about 10 pro possible kinds of projects that I thought of. Um, now, the ones that I think that are best, I put a star next to. OK? Does everybody kind of get that idea? Many of these don't have stars next to them. Does that mean I think that they're the best? No. OK? And historically, when I put together a list like this, what always happens is 90% of the graph class immediately gravitates among the worst project that is on my list. OK? A good project, you can not only sounds cool, but you sort of see where there's a data set, and you have relatively early in the proposal state an idea of what you're going to be doing. OK? So the wrong kind of proposal says, I'm going to build a, um, you know, a, uh, a uh, program to tell whether somebody's a vampire. OK? Now, why is that a bad project? If you have a data set of who's a vampire and who's not vampire, then that's a great project, possibly, right? But maybe you can't get data on this, right? Or maybe there isn't a reason to just tell that there isn't really a difference between vampire. There's maybe no reason to think you can make that kind of prediction, OK? So what I want to see for the proposals are, I want to see your group as a third in a you know, three-page-ish paper of what did they, what is your project going to be? Where is your data going to come from? Who else is there? You know, what, what other things have you found out about it? Just to make sure you've thought about your project enough that you, know, you really think you can go ahead and do something like that. 
Any questions? Any questions about what I want in a project topic? Okay, yes. Every team is going to submit one report. Now, what I am going to do is, uh, how do I grade it? I will read the project proposal. I will give it a grade. I will read the progress report. I will give it a grade. I will read your final report. It will give it a grade. Your final report will probably leverage stuff that was in your first two. So you're better off. It's good to start early here because you know, progress that you make early on counts towards later reports. Okay, And we give about half the grade for the project to the before the final report is due. So I do want you to start working on it early, not just the day before. Any questions? Okay. As far as how do I deal with students, you, you will form your own teams. One thing I will do is uh, take each member of the team, put them on different sides of the room, and have you rank what percentage of the project was yours versus your partners. And then I will look at this thing, and if you, know, if you say that uh, you, know, you did half the work and your other partner says the partner did 90% of the work, okay, then I will investigate further. Any questions? Okay. Okay. Any questions about the project? Okay. So let's just go through what I think are possible projects, some better than others. Okay. And some of these I think no one's going to be interested in, possibly for good reason, but uh, I want to go through them. So last time I taught the course, you know, I did these quant shop projects, okay, where I gave them these prop modeling challenges and they made movies and stuff. They didn't necessarily make great models, okay? They made movies, okay? Um, what would be a reasonable project in my mind, a perfectly reasonable project, if there was one of those challenges that you really, really liked, that you had a reason to believe you can really do better, okay? Um, I think that that's a fine thing to do. But I'm going to be expecting one where you're going to kind of, you know, um, do an, uh, uh, you know, a substantial new effort building on the old, okay? I would like it be, if you're going to do it, maybe you could make the model live so it's always running, okay? And will run for if years from now, collecting data as it needs it, okay? Rather than just one of these dead things that it's a report and some programs that no one's executed. So if you want it, if there's one of these projects that you really think you have an idea of what to do, Okay, and how to make it better, I'm willing to listen to that as a possible project. Any questions? Does that have a star next to it? It doesn't have a star. Okay, so okay, keep that in mind. The item number two, almost certainly no one's going to be interested in. But if somebody likes the idea of taking the project reports from last time and editing them into a more consistent thing that kind of, you know, because they were all written by different people and, and so, so, if someone was excited about that, uh, I would be happy to talk to them. Um, if you do, do you see a star next to that? No, I don't see a star. Okay. Item number three is one that I would like to see somebody, at least one group, do that I'm kind of interested in. For a variety of reasons, I'm interested in railroads now. Okay. And um, what I would love to do is to have a data set of all freight railroad lines in the United States, where they're located, how much traffic is moving forward on this, build basically a model of where all the, ro the railroad network in the United States or the world, OK? And um, you know, so I would love to see some, I have to believe that there is a mix of data out there in the world that is available about railroad networks, OK? And I want to see somebody, some group, build a consistent map or model of these kinds of things. So we really know where all the railroad lines are in the United States are. Something about perhaps how much they are being used, things like that. Yeah. Um, so what was the model that you used in the The goal of this model is to first build a data set that captures the entire railroad network. Okay. And then we see, first of all, how easy or hard that was. And then we find something interesting to deal with it. OK, so there are a bunch of interesting things that can be done once you have a really good idea of what the network is, OK? Where it goes geographically, OK? I'd love to be able to know the exact coordinates of every railroad line in the United States, OK? And the question is, can you build such a thing? Any questions? 
The answer is I don't know of anything, but I do know that railroads are in some sense public things. Okay, you can you know you, you know it's not like someone hides a railroad line. Okay, so so in principle there is there there is data someplace on this. Okay, and I would love to see some some group figure out how to build something from that. Any questions? And that does have a star for the record. Okay, but it's a, in order to do this, you have to be first convinced that, they, that you know where you can find this stuff. If you say, I can't find this stuff, even if there's a star, okay, it's not a good project. Any questions? Okay, next one. A couple of, of sort of what I would like to say are representative of the kinds of projects that I think would be cool modeling projects, okay? Taking a data set that would be making it do something kind of cool. One of them that I think would be interesting is about casting actors in movies, okay? That you could kind of imagine from IMDB, you've got a tremendous data set of what movies have been made and who the actors were in it, okay? And properties of these actors. And now my question is, if I make another movie, or I want to recast a different movie, let's say I want to take an Indian movie like Om Shanti Om, and I want to make it an American version of it, okay? Who should be in each role, okay? My claim is that by analyzing um, these kinds of this, this kind of data that is there, one can figure out what are analogous actors by different dimensions. Okay, perhaps one can figure out how much you know have a budget for the movie, and you know you can't, you know, you, you know you, you can't always buy the best actor for it. You have to figure these things out. Okay, so I want to say that that any questions about what that project would be. So it's kind of take a data set, try to come up with something, and uh, find something interesting to do there. Uh, the second, the th item five was a, um, what you call it, a thing on, you know, in many sports like baseball in the United States, there's data, players can get traded from one place to another. And so you have data on all these trades that were made, okay, uh, you know, where these players were traded for those players. Can you figure out from this some kind of a value system for players? In principle, when you're making a trade, both sides think they're getting the better of the trade, right? Which means presumably in theory that, that, that each trade should be equal. Can you come up with trying to figure out a value system for the things that are being traded? So you could later look at and take a guess for a possible trade. Is this a fair trade? Is this not a fair trade? Which side has the advantage? Things like this. And I claim that that, that that data for that, you know, can be used to make interesting system for that. Any questions? Okay. Um, item number six, which does not have a star, but sometimes we get students quite often who say, oh, I want to write a term paper or a review paper. I don't want to build my own system. I want to write a review paper. Um, what I'm saying is that um, the second page here is a bunch of, let's say, topics that I would like to see sort of reviews in some sense, little review papers of a bunch of these topics done describing where, um, what you call, what programs are the right ones, you know, what, what is the problem, what programs are available or, or libraries are there available in Python or R or something like that for solving this problem and details like that. And so if you want to write a, a survey paper and not do an original project, okay, that's what these kind of things are possible survey paper topics, okay? And my hope would be that it's, you would have each, a student like this would write several short surveys rather than one big one. But we could talk about that. Any questions? Item seven is an interesting data set that's that I saw that was available on city bike usage. How many people are familiar with the city bike program in the city? Okay, so just like the taxi data, you know, in some sense there are logs of every in the city. There is a way that if you are a if you pay um, for a subscription, as you'll notice, I have one. See, I've got me a city bike key. Okay, I can go to anywhere in Manhattan, stick this key into a bicycle rack. And they will let me borrow a bike, and I can have it for 45 minutes, and then I got to put it back someplace. And so the, every time that does it, that generates data about somebody took a bike from here to there. And all that data is available for analysis. 
And so the question is, can you do something interesting about city bike data? Can you figure out which trips on a bike were for fun and which were commuting trips? Can you figure out, um, let's say, where people, you know, where somebody is likely to go at a particular time or not based on the city bike data? So the city bike data set is an interesting data set. Okay? Any questions? Item 8 is someone that I do have a, that, that had a star. Item 8 also has a star. I am kind of interested in, for a variety of reasons, the frequency of names in every country. Okay? So um, what is the, you know, you know I, I would like to know what is the relative popularity of, um, a, you know, of the name Ravi. What fraction of the population has the name Ravi in India? Okay? Um, the, you know, my claim is that you should be able to get this data, okay, if you analyze it in a reasonable way. But it's a tricky thing. In the United States, there's a census that records every name of people, and you can get data about the frequency of names in the United States, but different countries have different census policies. And, you know, if I want to know what's the frequency of names in Zimbabwe, Okay, it's not immediately obvious how I figure that out. But what I want to see somebody do is to construct a data set that for essentially every country in the world will tell me what the frequency is of every name in that country, the relative frequency of each name in that country, first names and last names. Any questions about that? Okay, yeah. Okay, so what I say, you know, let's say that's, that's the two to three students type of thing. You know, again, in general, the, you know, how many students should be on a project? Well, recognize that kind of the effort is going to be divided by the number of students. And, you know, I'm going to look at somebody, if I have a project where there's 96 students on it, and it looks like it's a one student project, that doesn't help anybody. Does everybody see that? So you don't want dead weight on these things. But it has to do with the magnitude of what you want to do. Any questions? And we can discuss about it. If, 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 if I see a two, you know, more than two or three students on a project, I will be suspicious. Any questions? Okay. So any questions about the name stuff? Another project, that class of projects, relates to analyzing Wikipedia. I think Wikipedia is an amazing data source because it does have a lot of, you know, and sometimes all that there is to know, arguably, in a particular language. And there's an amazing number of things you can do with it if you're clever. And as we notice that there's lots of Wikipedias for every other language, every language in the world, or at least 130 languages in the world. So the question of what can you do with that, if you think cleverly about Wikipedia data, there might be a lot of interesting things you can do with it. One of them that I th talked about here, which with no star, but just as a representative, was maybe you could produce some kind of a phylogenetic tree of languages. How did languages evolve? Okay, I claim if you analyze the text in Wikipedia, you should be able to figure out how to do that. But there's lots of different things if you're clever thinking about Wikipedia. Any questions? And likewise, another great data set is this Google Ngrams data set. Okay, where there's, you know, for every, un for, for, you know, every short phrase in the world, we know how often it's been talked about as a function of time. There's got to be interesting things you can do, use that kind of data for. Any questions? Any questions about the projects? So what I want to see is, um, you know, two, you know, uh, on, you got to finish your project, in, your homework in here, that, I, that is due next week, right? After that, I'd like to see a proposal from you guys as to what you're going to be doing. And I'm happy to sit here and talk with groups. So go off, think about it. But then, starting next week, maybe you'll want to find me and start chatting. Like work on one project, Multiple teams can work on, on the same project. I would want them to work independently, OK? And one good thing about having multiple teams work on the same project is I can compare which one is better, OK? So it's easy for me to rank those, right? Because I've got the binary comparison data. Any question? Yes. Come to me. I would encourage you to come to me 